Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the first installment of our fall webinar series. Today, we will have Dr. Robin Murphy presenting Future of Medicine, Personalized Health with Genetic Testing. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, time permitting. If you would like to ask questions, you can do so through the present, through the uh, throughout the presentation by typing into the question box in your control panel at the right side of your screen. Please note this presentation is being recorded for future distribution. We are now ready to begin, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Robin Murphy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Robin. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is an exciting time in medicine. What we see, there's a huge jump in the technology related to genetic testing. Um, not only the cost and accessibility to the public, but also the clinical application. So I'm really excited to share that today with everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, so what we see is that over the past, you know, five, ten years, there's been this massive evolution in not only the um, technology related to genetic testing, but, all the, but also the accessibility. And with that accessibility, we see a, a jump in clinical application as well as the adoption into health management strategies. So in particular, we're looking at how this, this genetic testing has influenced healthcare related to what's called individualized medicine. So in order to understand kind of individualized care and genetic testing, what we want to look at and appreciate is just how different we are from one another. We know looking at one another that there's a um, distinct difference between how we look, our eye color, our hair color, um, but that individuality is actually determined by our genetics. And not, not only does it affect our physical characteristics, but as well as our biochemical differences. And so this is what we refer to as genetic individuality. And what we see is that this influences how we're responding, not only to our environment, but also to medicine, to treatment strategies, and that there's no one size fits all. And what we're talking about today is something very specific in genetic testing called lifestyle genetic testing. So this is looking at predisposition to how the body is responding to the environment and very specifically looking at diseases, more um, accurately lifestyle diseases and the risk that certain lifestyle choices have in relationship to developing those disease, but also the interventions that we can implement to then mitigate some of that risk. And just as a baseline, I think it's important for us to understand exactly what is genetics. Uh, what we're talking about is your DNA. So your DNA, the best way to think about this is in relationship to a blueprint. A blueprint is a set of instructions that's providing information to your cells on how to function and um, how to produce or what to produce in the environment. And so we can, I'm going to flip ahead here. So when we look at the genetics, um, every single uh, cell in our body that has a nucleus contains all of our DNA. And all of the DNA, if we were to accumulate this together and tie it from end to end, it would extend from the earth to the sun and back 70 times. So I just want you to appreciate the amount of information that is embedded with each of our cells. And the information is depicted into a code. Um, these codes are represented by letters, A, C, T, and G. And a string of these letters will make up a gene. And so depending on the order of these uh, letters, they're called nucleotides, will determine exactly what is the um, string or the, um, the number of proteins and types of proteins that are getting strung together. So we can see here, if the cell is reading the code, each three letters will then be represented by an amino acid. And the amino acid, when they're linked together, this is what makes a protein. And essentially, the whole body is a protein-making machine. So uh, this is how the genes will then direct the cells. Now, when we get into looking at genetic testing, what we're starting to identify is how changes within the genetic code can actually influence our health. So when we look at something called a single nucleotide polymorphism, 
we're looking at a single, so one of these letters, uh, nucleotides, which is the letter, um, being changed. And so we can see here, if we change this T, uh, which previously the C, T, T uh, developed a leucine, if we change this into a C, this changes it into a proline. So the genetic testing that we're looking at is called SNP testing, S-N-P. Uh, we're looking at some of these changes and how they can affect the proteins and then the outcome of those proteins in clinical practice. So this is how we start to determine some of the personalized insights when we're looking at specific lifestyle interventions. So I'd like to demonstrate uh, a few areas of how we can actually uh, look at this and, and test for it and the results. So specifically, when we look at um, individual nutritional needs, Health Canada kind of provides these nutritional guidelines in the form of recommended daily intake. And this is, these intakes and these amounts are actually to avoid deficiency, but not necessarily for optimal nutritional status. And when we look at statistics related to how many Canadians are actually meeting these requirements, we can see there's a high degree of um, deficiencies uh, and prevalence where people are not actually meeting uh, the needs. On top of this, what, we, what, we're, what Health Canada is not taking into account when they're recommending certain dosages and requirements is that every single nutrient, every vitamin uh, that we're consuming has to be digested, absorbed through the digestive tract, and then transported through the blood, uh, up, taken up into the cell, and then metabolized so that we can use this vitamin in a... Um, actionable way, so a usable manner. So each one of these steps are actually influenced by our genetics. And so what, this, what, the, what the effect is, is that we see that individuals actually require much higher levels of certain nutrients, and importantly, even different forms. So an example of this, probably the, the most well-known, is dealing with folic acid and uh, B vitamins. So you may have heard the methylation pathway. Um, there's a specific gene called uh, FUT2, which is fucosyl transferase. And this actually reduces the absorption, so the efficiency of B12 absorption. Uh, and another gene affects its recycling. And so based on not only genetic predisposition, but also age, uh, disease, what we find is 30% of adults can have malabsorption issues where they're not absorbing enough of the B12, and they're actually getting to about 1% absorption rate. So if we look at Health Canada requirements, which are 2.4 micrograms of B12 daily, if we're only getting 1% of that based on genetic uh, predispositions um, and other environmental factors, then this has a huge impact on, on actually how much of this B vitamin we're getting. And if you look at the B vitamin pathway, B12 and folic acid, this is essential for every single cell to function. It's what's providing the necessary byproducts for uh, DNA, RNA repair, and cellular replication. And so identifying this uh, variant and this potential for uh, deficiency, we know that uh, obviously a higher dosage is required, but also we can change the form into sublingual for some individuals. Another gene related to folate metabolism, it's called MTHFR, actually reduces how effectively the body is able to produce the active form of folate, where what we see is 10% of the population has up to a 90% reduction in enzyme function. And what happens is this increases the, the risk for uh, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, because the body can't utilize folic acid in order to help eliminate uh, homocysteine from the body. And so identifying this early on, A, we can uh, not only test for homocysteine, uh, but we can also look at what type of folate we're providing, uh, whether it's through diet or um, the active form in the form of MTHF. What we see a huge impact on as far as nutrigenomics, how genetics can influence our nutritional requirements, is when we look at vegetarians. 
vegetarians who are deciding, uh, you know, based on their own ethical um, and moral reasons that they want to follow a plant-based diet. There are certain nutrients that we actually require uh, proper conversion in order to have the uh, active form. So essential fatty acids, these are our omega-3s, omega-6s. Uh, we can achieve these, we can take these in from plant sources. But again, due to genetic variations, what we see is not everybody is able to convert these plant-based omegas into the active form. The active form being EPA, DHA. These are important for controlling inflammation as well as blood clotting. And so individuals who have a, a low ability to convert these uh, omega-3 fatty acids, actually what we find is that if they're not consuming omega-3s uh, from an animal-based source or in high enough levels, it actually increases the risk of metabolic syndrome. And what, we've, and what is more important with that is that if we identify this early on, we can actually mitigate and completely abolish the risk of metabolic syndrome just by implementing and increasing the amount of three, omega-3s that are available in the diet. We also see this with vitamin A. Vitamin A comes from beta carotene. It gets converted into the active form, which is retinol. And based on genetic variants, there can be an extremely poor conversion of the beta carotene into the active form. And what happens is uh, the body retains the beta carotene and this can cause an orange, oranging effect within the skin. You'll see it in the hands and the palms uh, of the hands and the feet. And so uh, this is particularly important for vegetarians because vitamin A typically comes from animal sources. So if you're only relying on plant sources to compensate, uh, we actually find that tissue levels of the active retinol or vitamin A are not um, are, are deficient. And if you try and just increase the plant sources to compensate, the digestive tract actually has a mechanism to shut down absorption because it realizes that the beta carotene levels are becoming too high. Um, and we don't want to look like Oompa Loompas. <laughs> So as a, as a brief introduction into some of the nutrients or nutrigenomic uh, impact that genes have, we see that vitamin A, uh, B12, and folate can all be impacted, as well as vitamin D, iron, choline, and essential fatty acids. So by identifying these uh, early on through genetic testing, we're able to know, uh, A, what dietary strategies can be effective for helping to reduce the risk of deficiency, and then if necessary, looking at some blood tests to follow up to see how these genes are impacting the body. Now, one of the biggest um, you know, questions that I get with clin clinicians as well as with patients is there's a fear that comes with doing this type of testing. They say, I don't wanna know my genes. You know, I, I don't wanna know how I'm gonna die. And that's dramatic, uh, I'll admit, but this is not a test to tell you what disease you're gonna die from. Um, we're looking at genes that can be modified from the environment, and therefore this is about knowing the actions that you can take to effectively change your health. And a, a great example of this is looking at sensitivities to specific foods, uh, particularly when we look at caffeine. So, you know, the saying goes, uh, one man's poison can be another person's superfood. Uh, maybe that's not a saying, I just made it up, but uh, we see that specifically when it comes to caffeine. So caffeine, um, based on genetic variations, someone can either be a slow metabolizer or fast metabolizer. So but there's about a 50% difference in the population. So if you uh, are sitting next to someone, it's likely that uh, one of you has the fast version and the other person has the slow version. Now we don't know this um, unless we kind of look at the genetics and understand how you're processing caffeine. If someone is a slow metabolizer and they're drinking more than four cups of coffee a day, we actually see a increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And so as the caffeine is being consumed, if you're a slow metabolizer, the caffeine has longer to have an effect on the body. 
Uh, as I mentioned, this can increase risk of non-fatal heart attack, so by 64%, which is pretty significant. Um, it also affects how we're processing chemicals that are found in our food. So particularly looking at meat, uh, there's studies looking at how a high intake of processed and smoked meat can influence risk for colon health or co uh, colon cancer, uh, but only for those who have the fast version of the uh, gene that, uh, that affects caffeine metabolism. And then finally, what's interesting is this gene, this enzyme, also processes estrogen. So there was a study that was done of women who were carriers of the BRCA1 gene. This uh, increases risks for women's um, predisposition to ovarian and endometrial cancer. And what they found is the women who were the slow metabolizers, who consumed two cups of coffee a day before the age of 35 had a 64% reduction in breast cancer risk compared to those who had no coffee uh, and then there was no effect for the fast metabolizers. So pretty significant and when we're, we're just talking about caffeine consumption here and how caffeine is influencing how the gene and the gene variant is getting expressed uh, and more importantly what we can do about it. Um, it's very common, um, or another great example is through gluten. You know, should we really avoid gluten? 1% um, of the, the Canadian population is actually celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease, while 33% um, of Canadians actually avoid gluten. And it's important to know, uh, not only from a genetic standpoint, you know, there is other reasons for removing the gluten from the diet, maybe environmental, um, but what we see in the genetics, we can identify those who are at a predisposition to celiac disease as well as gluten sensitivity. And so if you are a carrier of a certain version of a gene, HLA, DQ, 2.5 or 8, um, there's a higher risk of developing celiac disease. So if you're a carrier, about 90% uh, of individuals are carriers of this uh, gene who have celiac disease. But what's interesting is only 10% of the people who are carrying those, those, that version of the, the gene will actually develop the disease. And what this tells us is the risk factors to developing celiac or gluten sensitivity depend on these, envir these environmental factors. So it has to do with gluten exposure. There was a study that was done in Denmark where it, between the um, time of 70, 1972 and 1989, there was a seven-fold increase in celiac disease um, in, oh, sorry, in Sweden uh, compared to Denmark. And so what they noticed is that the infant diet contained over 40 times more gliden, the protein within gluten, in Sweden than it did in Denmark. So what this tells us is that these children, there may have been similar distribution of the gene variants between the populations, but it was the amount of gluten and the timing of gluten that led to the expression of the disease. So identifying this, you can lower gluten intake, get testing, um, or remove it completely. Um, there's other environmental factors which can influence disease as well. Um, so thinking about, you know, it, it, has there been any infections? Is there a family history of celiac disease or any autoimmune diseases um, or other genetic diseases that can increase risk? And diet, you know, when we, when we talk about this, this subject, um, there's a lot of confusion in the media. We see that, you know, one decade's saturated fats are, and fats are terrible for us. Um, it causes obesity, it causes heart disease. And then a decade later, we see, oh, we made a mistake. It's actually that uh, fat is good for us and we need to increase our fat consumption. And, and this is where we've seen a trend in the keto diet, you know, high fat. And what we see uh, across the board is that for some, this may be an excellent way to reduce insulin resistance as well as to lose weight. Uh, but for others, they're, they're not getting the same effect. And so with diet, there there's, tends to be this trial and error approach. Uh, and what's happening here is that the genetics and how we're interacting with our food, how, how we're responding, you know, the hormonal response to the food is dependent on genetic variants and the individual response. 
And so specifically when we look at saturated fat, fat intake, specific versions of a gene called APOA2 um, can actually increase risk of obesity by 84%. And what's happening is that in these individuals, when they consume a high calorically dense meal, especially with high fat, uh, rather than feeling that sense of satiety uh, and satiation, what happens is they lose that, that signal. So it becomes muted. And no longer are they feeling full after eating a high fat meal. They feel like a little extra you know, snack or um, they just keep eating <laughs> despite uh, having a large meal. So this actually increases their caloric consumption by about 220 uh, kilocalories per day, which leads to uh, an increased risk for weight gain. And what's interesting, and you're probably seeing a theme you know, in the talk here, is that we can actually modify these effects. It has to do with how much fat you're consuming. And when they look at the studies, it's very specific about how we can guide uh, individuals into how much fat they're consuming based on reducing their risk for obesity or weight, um, but also reducing uh, cholesterol levels as well. So if they're consuming less than 22 grams per day, we see that this genetic effect is abolished. They actually weigh less than other individuals with a different genetic variation. Um, so limiting saturated fat as well as dairy intake. And we see this with carbohydrates as well. So we're starting to get a picture of the macronutrients uh, ratios that can be uh, delivered and strategized to the individual. Looking at, um, is there a risk for type two diabetes? Um, this is actually dependent on whether or not they're consuming a high amount of refined carbohydrates versus whole carbohydrates or whole grains. Um, and what's interesting about this is this particular gene if there's an increased risk in type 2 diabetes, um, it only presents if they're on a low-fat diet. Therefore, certain individuals will actually benefit from a high-fat diet versus uh, low-fat. So we can start to see how uh, certain genes can be uh, grouped together to get an understanding of the right diet for the right person at the right time. Physical exercise, uh, again, we're looking at lifestyle interventions and what your tolerance is overall. Um, with exercise, what's happening is as we're increasing the demand for energy uh, production from each of our cells, there's uh, a, a risk for high oxidative stress and the ability of the body to be able to protect the cells from this oxidative stress to recycle um, the reactive oxygen species that are coming off of the high um, uh, energy production. We see that based on um, certain genes called SOD2, it can increase the chance for inflammation and muscle damage if they're engaging in a high intensity interval training or vigorous types of exercise. And to be more specific, it, the studies are looking at individuals who are exercising for more than 45 minutes um, as well as for more than uh, 10 kilometers. And they can actually measure markers to see the amount of muscle damage that occurs. So I had a case um, where a, a young woman, she was a physical trainer. She, she loved going to the gym. Um, she started getting widespread muscle pain uh, and ended up, it was so bad that she ended up in the hospital. They looked at her levels, her markers for muscle damage, creatinine kinase, and they were through the roof. And the doctors, you know, looked at everything um, from autoimmune disease, genetic diseases, and these are inborn genetic diseases that they were looking for, um, but couldn't find anything. She, so she was kind of sent home saying, well, we can't figure it out, not sure what happened, um, be careful, you know, not, not too uh, helpful for her at that point. So when we did her genetic testing, she did have the marker for uh, a high risk for muscle damage. And we were able to implement something called NAC, uh, which is an antioxidant. It helps to protect the muscles. She was also given guidelines on the type of exercise she was able to um, tolerate as well. So um, we also see that it can affect collagen formation and risk for injuries. Um, so this is all important for athletes and particularly um, those high level athletes. 
what's really fascinating, and you know, this is this is one of the most interesting areas I find, is when we're looking at how genetics can actually influence personality. Um, and personality, we can relate that to uh, not only dispositions, but also mood and sensitivity to stress. And there are key enzymes that can influence how much adrenaline we have available within our body, um, which can affect how resilient or sensitive we are to stress. So a particular gene called comt um, it, it stands for catechol o methyltransferase And so some individuals, similar to what we saw with caffeine, is that some can be a fast metabolizer, um, where the enzyme has an increased rate and speed at which it functions, and some are actually slow metabolizers. So it's a three to four fold decrease in how quickly this enzyme works and the effect that it has on the dopamine. So if someone is in a stressful situation and they're producing a lot of dopamine, uh, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and their body isn't as efficient at removing that dopamine, there's a certain threshold where we'll find that dopamine will have a positive effect. It helps with motivation, drive, uh, attentiveness. But once you reach that threshold and there's too much dopamine, that's where we start to see it have uh, some detrimental effects. So that's where this worrier motif can come out. Um, so in certain situations, how they've deemed this version of the gene, you can be a worrier. Um, and time and time again, I'll tell, uh, I'll help people understand their genetics. And I'll say, well, I don't know you, but I, I would guess that you are a worrier type, increased risk for anxiety uh, and potentially sleep problems. And it's like, I'm reading a crystal ball <laughs> uh, because they're just shocked that how much this gene and these variants can have effect on their um, dispositions. And so if you're a warrior, uh, the enzyme has a decrease, um, or I should say, uh, increased speed at which it can clear dopamine. And so in a stressful scenario, these individuals actually perform better at certain cognitive um, tasks. Um, and what's interesting, this is starting to get into a branch called pharmacogenomics, but those individuals who have the FAST enzyme are actually predicted to be uh, and seen to be a poor responder to antidepressants. So we can start to predict, you know, which medications are going to be ideal for certain individuals um, and help them to alleviate some of the, uh, you know, trial and error approach, especially when it comes to mental health and some of the drugs that they're using. It can be a matter of life and death uh, in those scenarios. Uh, and a lot of these genes uh, and enzymes, they not only uh, influence one part of our body, but they affect very various systems. So we talked about COMPT and uh, how it relates to dopamine and adrenaline. Well, it also affects our hormones and it can affect how well we're able to eliminate estrogen metabol metabolites. And so, as I mentioned, if someone has an increased risk for a decrease in enzyme activity, then they are um, at risk for poor clearance of estrogen. And so there is some thought, uh, and what we're starting to see is they may be at an increased risk for endocrine disruptors, as well as using uh, exogenous uh, estrogens. And what we find is that there's a higher percentage of women who have premature ovar ovarian failure have the slow version of this gene. So if anyone's looking at balancing their hormones, they're having any sort of um, hormonal dysregulation, they're thinking about doing birth control or um, synthetic hormones, it's a good idea to understand how the body is actually responding to this and whether or not um, the particular dose or particular form is uh, right for you as well. We also know that B vitamins, so B complex, is extremely important to support this enzyme. And if individuals come back that they have a risk for low enzyme activity, we can just introduce uh, some of the B vitamins and other uh, factors, uh, magnesium included, to help eliminate some of these excess estrogen um, and support them from an individual uh, biochemical standpoint. 
So that's just a, a brief example of uh, some of the key areas that we can use genetic testing to help personalize and individualize um, our approach and treatment to not only our own health, but patient health, uh, customer health as well. So this gives you a nice overlay of, of some of the key areas that we can use genetic testing to help uh, inform individuals. So looking at diet, I mentioned fat, carbohydrate uh, consumption, what uh, ratio of macronutrients, specific nutrients, um, looking at our mood and mental well, uh, well, wellness, is there a risk for addiction? Uh, some of the uh, nuances about memory and how well you perform under stress. Uh, is there a risk for obesity? And looking at some of these other uh, lifestyle uh, factors such as food sensitivities and intolerances, physical fitness, um, and then getting into detoxification and hormone, which really these two um, are aligned together because we know that part of how we process our hormones, it has to do with uh, the deactivation and removal of these hormones. So identifying this gives us a, a very succinct action plan where we're looking at kind of a blueprint so that we can uh, understand what are the specific steps that we need to take to have um, significant impact on our uh, health. So we think of all the, you know, I'm going to say billions, but trillions of pieces and good, good information that's out there on the internet. Um, you know, we're kind of in the era of information. How do you really know what nutrient is best for you? What dose? What form? Um, we're tired of this trial and error approach when it comes to dietary interventions, um, even supplementation um, and exercise. And then clinically, we can also see that it helps to identify what specific tests we need to either identify the impact that this gene is having or uh, prevention um, in order to uh, properly um, surveillance whether or not these genes are having an impact in lifestyle related diseases. And this is all part of the development of individualized medicine, where we're looking at personalizing individual treatment plans that are predictive as well as preventative. So we're using uh, individual genetic risk markers to help uh, inform the best strategy uh, with the most effective outcome. Um, and it's part of education too. So it's a, it's a participation not only with, with the doctors, but also with the patients and consumers. And we're seeing, uh, this is where I'm really passionate, is about helping to empower uh, the public. And we're no longer you know, looking for this one pill, one outcome. The hum I'll tell you right now, the human body is not that simple. Um, and we see that it's actually not helping with quality of life or, or um, progression of the disease. And genetic testing, we think of this as a piece of the puzzle. So uh, we're looking at how the genes are relating to not only the um, external environment, uh, nutrients, uh, diet, lifestyle, uh, we're also looking at how it is influenced by sleep, by stress, our relationships, our emotions. Uh, and all of this is kind of the root into uh, developing uh, disease and affecting the systems overall. So lifestyle genetic testing, it tells us about our susceptibility towards uh, lifestyle related diseases, but it tells us more uh, specifically what lifestyle choices to make in order to change the outcome of these genes and said uh, diseases. And so this is where um, I'm really excited to be working with AOR in helping them to uh, produce and develop this um, genetic test called My Blueprint. And so the My Blueprint looks at these key areas of lifestyle interventions um, that I mentioned to help 
uh, bring this technology and bring this information to the public as a whole. What's important is the types of genetic testing that is out there. We want to make sure that any of the tests are extremely accurate in, in what they're reporting. And so AOR is using a actually diagnostic lab that has a, what's called the CLIA certification, where there is a 99.7% accuracy and 99.999% uh, reproducibility, meaning that there is um, the, the results that are being reported are accurate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how this information is getting um, delivered, and it's through an online portal, which is compliant with Health Canada's um, Privacy Protection Act, so it's HIPAA compliant. Um, you know, I've tried to make the, the, uh, the information here as simple as possible, um, but I can go down the route of getting into the complexities um, and kind of nerd out uh, when it comes to the science behind some of these genes and the effect that it has on the body. Um, but luckily I have a team, uh, an amazing team that helps to put this into layman's terms. So again, there's actionable steps that everyone can understand. It can make significant impacts um, in the choices that they're making to improve their health as well as give them a um, very you know, short list of key uh, changes that they can make uh, through diet, lifestyle, as well as supplementation. And so to collect DNA, it's very simple. It's just a matter of a cheek swab. Uh, we're getting some buccal, buccal cells which contain all the DNA uh, and that's gonna be uh, processed at the, um, it's gonna be sent to the company here in Toronto and then processed in the lab in Houston. So once the information is processed and sent back, uh, the, it will be uploaded into an online portal and platform. And so this way uh, you can log on, see your results, and it's accessible on the computer, on your phone. Um, so very easy to kind of scroll through and learn about yourself kind of anywhere you go. Um, there is a, a PDF report as well that can be printed um, for those who are interested in looking at the paper version. So this just gives you an overlay of kind of how the report is laid out, where it'll talk about kind of general information about the importance of diet, um, for example, and fat consumption. If there is a take action, that's when we've identified a certain version of a gene that has a, a, an outcome or potential outcome on your health. And then more importantly, what are the exact steps that you need, need to follow in order to help mitigate that risk? So that's summarized um, there as well. And with the explosion of genetic testing into the market, uh, some of the concern that has come up is uh, the privacy. You know, this is a, a new era. This is genetic information. It's very personal. Um, so some consumers are worried that the, the data is going to be used for big pharma um, or some other insurance or employer, you know, companies for discrimination. I just want to, um, you know, let everyone know that a Canada has done has just passed a bill um, that it's called GINA, Genetic Non Discrimination Act, which prevents um, employers as well as insurance companies from accessing this information um, to use against them for insurance insurance policy uh, or uh, work, and uh, they can't ask about it either. And then also what AOR has done, which is very unique. Um, to the companies that are out there is that they've actually made a pledge to not uh, distribute the de-identified data, so not use that data or sell that data to any third party. And so I just want to be clear in that other companies, it's not that they're giving your personal information out, but they're using your de-identified data and being it's being sold to, say, Big Pharma um, to do research um, for, say, pharmaceutical uh, development. Um, and that's fine, uh, but the AOR has kind of taken uh, a different approach. And so they're ensuring that the data will not be sold. Uh, the samples, just as another layer of uh, security, the samples are going to be destroyed after six months. 
Um, and then any of the data, uh, personal data that's related to the um, login information, it's encrypted uh, and not accessible by the company. That's kept on a separate server. And then the other information is de-identified and kept uh, on an alternate ser server here in Canada. So that brings me to the end of uh, the presentation today. I'm going to open it up to questions. And uh, I just wanted to kind of let everyone know that um, if they're looking for more information related to kind of genetic based tips, I've made a resource that you can find at my website. Um, the, the URL is just at the bottom there. Um, so drrobinmurphy.com forward slash genetic tips. Okay, so I'll hand it uh, over to you. Cassie. Wonderful, thank you for such an informative presentation, Robin, that was awesome. I think it's such an exciting field um, that's continuously developing. And I know from personal experience, it can make a big difference in your health and your well-being, and just feeling your best. So if there are any questions from the audience, you can type them into the question box found in your control panel um, on the right-hand side. And while we're waiting for those to come in, I'll just go over a few exciting information informational tidbits that are coming up. Um, so we do have the next webinar in this fall series coming up on September 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Paul Herkel. He will be presenting on the power of PEA, which is a very exciting new product coming out with AOR. So if you've not yet registered for that, you can sign up at AOR.ca. Um, and we just received one question here. So what is the cost of the My Blueprint test kit? Do you want to speak to that, uh, Kathy? Yeah, sure. I can definitely do that. Um, sorry, give me one second here. Let me just quickly pull it up. Just while we're waiting, I'll, I'll summarize as well. You know, when you see someone coming into the store or into the clinic, we think, who is this test going to be useful for? And based on the areas that we're looking at, we see diet, nutrient, uh, detoxification, hormones, weight loss. Um, I mentioned a few uh, lifestyle genetic diseases, so metabolic nutrition, weight gain, or sorry, metabolic um, syndrome, weight gain, uh, hormonal dysregulation, if there's any family history of celiac disease, uh, this is where we can start to think of um, guiding people to using this test uh, to help uncover some of the more individualized nuances about their health, but also about uh, the choices that they're making. Yeah, definitely. And it retails for $350 for the test. Um, and so the next question is, can the 23andMe results be used to generate this report? Mm. So uh, what people are referring to, just for everybody else out there, um, 23andMe is a pretty large direct-to-consumer um, company, I would say the largest. And the platform that they're using, they're testing uh, over 500,000 um, SNPs. So what uh, other companies have done is they've um, downloaded the raw data from 23andMe, and then you can upload that into a specific platform that has actually been designed to uh, go through the 23andMe data and then upload the results into a report. So um, the test that we're using here, we actually are taking the genetic sample, um, identifying specific markers and then reporting them um, through a different platform. So we don't have the capability to take that raw data from another test panel and upload it into the AOR report. Okay. Do we test for the SNP that has to do with glutathione? So we test um, at currently two of three of the SNPs, and we're looking at two of the enzymes. So we're looking at uh, glutathione, uh, the T1 form, GSTT1, and we're also looking at GSTP1. So T1, I call the big daddy of the, the family. It's kind of found everywhere. Um, people can actually be missing this gene, and, they, um, and the P1 is related more towards brain, uh, lung, and reproductive health. 
Um, so we have we see an influence with uh, hormone and effects um, in steroid metabolism and metabolites. So yes, we are um, testing uh, two of those genes. Do either of those genes have an impact with mental health as well? Hmm. Um, so the, the research that I've come across uh, are looking specifically at cardiovascular disease as well as cancers. Um, and that's what I've really focused my attention on. When it comes to mental health, I can't quote uh, specifically if I've seen um, how they impact, but just kind of thinking about how um, in mental health, we're looking at COMPT, we're looking at DRD2, some of the genes that influence catecholamine metabolism and binding, those have a huge impact, but also oxidative stress uh, has been implica implicated in, in inflammation of the brain leading to uh, mental health disorders. So uh, I'm sure there's research out there. I haven't specifically seen it, um, but it would be an interesting area to uh, navigate, yeah. Awesome. And what age can parents use this test on their children? Well, our genes don't change. <laughs> and because it's a buccal swab uh, rather than a saliva sample, um, you can actually get it pretty easily from babies. What I would put out there to the public is what, what, are, gonna, what are the action steps that you are planning to implement in doing this test? So I have had uh, colleagues uh, use it in their children. Um, so, uh, you know, four to six years of age, and they've noticed that by giving them certain doses of vitamins, uh, certain forms of vitamins, that it's actually helped with their development and their behavior. Um, I mentioned celiac disease, and so celiac disease, you want to know as early as possible uh, if that could be a potential outcome. If there's a family history, I would say uh, earlier the better. Uh, and then with other, some of the other lifestyle factors, I, I typically recommend parents um, maybe look at it when they're uh, talking to their teenagers about educating them about a healthy lifestyle um, as they're becoming more uh, integrated in their own choices that they're making um, to affect their health. Awesome. And if a customer happens to contaminate the sample, can they redo it and send it again? Yes, they can. Awesome. Um, then we got a question about what about DAO in terms of histamines? Yeah, we look at the histamine pathway. So we're looking at diamine amino oxidase um, as well as so histamine intolerance and histamine sensitivity uh, risk for allergies is influenced um, by how well the body is able to remove histamine. So it's not just through the DAO enzyme, it's also through a methylation pathway. So we're looking at both of those genes together. Um, and it brings up an important part is that we're looking at uh, very complex algorithms to see how these genes interact into one outcome. So with allergies, we can see someone may have uh, or be missing or have a, a reduced ability with DAO enzyme, which we know affects more gastrointestinal levels of histamine um, and mucous membrane but um, they may be fine when it comes to the methylation uh, and removal of histamine in that pathway. So they, the way that it gets expressed may not be allergies, uh, it may be more gastrointestinal related. So that's just a, a side. Okay, so then are we testing for SNPs where methyl donors are contraindicated? Um, so, hmm, that's an interesting question. Because methyl donors are, uh, say, methylfolate, methyl B12, um, there are genes that we're looking at where it's it's not necessarily contraindicated, but we know that some individuals have a harder time um, tolerating those forms of vitamins. Um, in particular, it has to do with um, the COMPT gene. So if someone has a tendency for high catecholamines or high uh, stress levels, if they take a, a high methylated form without the balance of some of the other uh, B vitamins, then it can lead to high levels of adrenaline uh, and more anxiety. So in that case, we recommend uh, a hydroxycobalamin or adenosyl cobalamin or mixture of the two with the B complex. I hope okay, that answers your question. Um, do we test for APOE4 
as well? This is a hot topic. Um, so currently we are in the process of development of adding this. Uh, originally, because this is a direct-to-consumer test, the we wanted to be careful about the type of information that was being delivered so that the, the public understood that these genes, although they can increase risk of, say, you know, a pretty scary disease such as Alzheimer's, that there's actual lifestyle um, choices that can be made to mitigate the risk. And so initially, we thought that this information should be delivered through a practitioner. Um, there has been such a interest that we're, we're in discussion about developing it and adding it to the test. So if there are um, additions, if there's uh, updates to the panel, to the test, then individuals who have done the testing will also have access to those. Awesome. Um, so we did get asked when will kits be available in stores. Um, I believe they already are, and you can also order it online at myblueprint.ca. Um, yeah, they've so, been out for, uh, I, I believe, a couple months now, uh, at least. So you can find them on the shelves of uh, many health food stores. I don't think we have a list, um, but that might be something valuable to the public. Agreed. We can definitely look into getting that and sending it out as an addition to the follow-up um, email that will be coming out to the audience. Um, one last question that came in here is when updates come out, would those cost extra be included in the original test? As long as they're within, so updates to the actual report uh, related to research and genetic variants, those are going to be available um, to anyone that has done the genetic panel. Um, we can just update the report um, online. When it comes to genetic variants, um, as long as it's been included within the panel when the genetic sample uh, was obtained, then we're able to make those updates. Um, and if we haven't destroyed the sample, <laughs> it's another. So if it has, if it's been less than six months, then uh, the opportunity is there to update it. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Murphy, for the awesome presentation, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you do have additional questions that you weren't able to get answered in today's Q&A period, you can email them to marketing at aor.ca, so that's M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G at aor.ca, and we will be uh, coordinating with Dr. Murphy to get answers for you and can send those out to you. Um, again, we have our upcoming webinar on this September 26th, so we hope to see you all there. Thanks again so much for joining us. Great. Thanks, guys.